Thank you everybody for joining in. My name is Rachel Lava. I'm one of the faculty ophthalmologists here at Iowa State University, and I'm thrilled to be talking with you about equine eye problems. Um, I'm also involved with an organization called the International Equine Ophthalmology Consortium, so I wanted to give a little shout out to that organization. We have our uh, members all over the world. About half of our members are ophthalmologists, so board certified veterinary ophthalmologists, and about half are general practitioners with more equine specific interest, although honestly anybody can join. Um, we even have a couple technicians and veterinary students who are members, and so I've been fortunate enough to be involved in this group for the past, oh gosh, I think like eight years, and I'm currently on the board of directors and uh, I'm serving as the president-elect, so if anybody wants more information on this group after watching this, I'm happy to chat with you if you're a veterinarian or technician or anything. Um, um, so, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Who cares about equine eyes? Oh, I clicked the button over here. There we go. Well, obviously, since you're here watching it, you do. And of course, as, a equine, as an ophthalmologist, I definitely do. Um, many of you have heard the saying, no foot, no horse. And though I completely agree that that's true, the same might be said about eyes. Because unfortunately, if horses don't have good vision, then sometimes they're not seen as valuable to their owners for whatever purpose they were supposed to serve. And they might get sold or even worse, might get euthanized. And so therefore, we want to strive to do everything we can to maintain vision and comfort in these horses in order to keep them in their homes and being useful. And so what we'll talk about today are some equine eye basics. We'll get started on that. Um, then I'll spend the majority of the time talking about the common eye problems that horses um, have. We will then spend just a brief few moments at the end talking about when to call a vet and when to possibly see a specialist. So starting out with the basics, equine vision is something a lot of owners want to know. Hey, what does my horse see? And it's actually really cool. Horses have a nearly 360 degree, degree visual field. And this is the horizontal visual field because obviously they need to be able to monitor the horizon for any threats and predators. Their only blind spots are right underneath the nose and straight behind the tail. And again, that puts us at, at about 350 degrees total visual field. However, with each eye having a large visual field, it only leaves a very narrow area of binocular vision, which is about 60 degrees. And that's why when horses see something that they need to study more, they really crank their head and take a look um, down at it so that they have it lined up in that binocular visual field area. Visual acuity with horses is pretty darn good, not that much less than humans, and it's definitely a little better than dogs and cats. Um, however, horses, along with many other animals, don't have a lot of accommodation, so they can't quickly adjust from seeing far to seeing near, and they're gonna use other views, or sorry, clues to assess those things. Um, and then from a color vision standpoint, this is where a lot of people are curious. Humans have trichromatic vision, meaning that we have three different um, cones in the back of our eyes, Cones are those uh, photoreceptors that, that help with vision. And uh, horses only have two types of cones, so they have dichromatic vision. And so if we look at these color spectra, humans see all these different rainbow of colors. However, horses are gonna see in more the yellow, blue, gray tones. And so looking at some examples, this is a picture as a human sees it. And this is the same picture altered to how the horse might see it. A little bit more out of focus and definitely the color tone is different. Here's the other picture, how humans see it, and then again, how a horse might see it. So now we'll move into some of the equine ocular anatomy. So in general, eyes are fairly conserved across species. We all have a cornea, we all have a lens, we all have a retina, and indeed horses have the same basic structure. But there are some unique aspects of their anatomy that are worthwhile for us to touch on. So first of all, their eyes are laterally placed, and we already alluded to the importance of this with that broad visual field that they have because they are prey species and they need to know if something's trying to sneak up on them so they can run away. When we look at their eyes, we also see that horses have these upper eyelashes, um, only up top, not on the bottom. And you can even see them on this picture here. This was my childhood horse. I think took this picture when I was like nine or 10. And normal horses with nice open eyes have those eyelashes directed out horizontally. And that's where you want to see them. On the flip side, when we have horses who have abnormalities causing pain to their eye, then they might have the eyelid more closed or might even be squinting the eye. And if those eyelashes are directed downward, that should be an indicator that, wait a second, somebody needs to check out this eye and see what's going on. So use them as a clue. 
Horses also had these extra sensory hairs um, around the eye, usually one or two above and below, called vibrissae. And these hairs are important so that when horses are nosing around, grazing on the ground with maybe some bushes nearby, or eating hay out of a bunk, if they get the eye a little bit too close to something that could be traumatizing, those vibrissae hairs are gonna feel it, they're sensitive to it. So those are important hairs that I recommend not trimming away unless you have to trim them up if you're getting a horse ready for a show. Otherwise, think of them as the little protectors with the antennas out there. The third eyelid is also an important structure in horses and seen in many other animal species. The third eyelid is typically tucked down in the medial, so inner, inside corner of the eye. And when the third eyelid comes up, it's like an extra windshield wiper coming across the eye. So horses don't always have to blink their upper and lower eyelids to spread tear foam or to protect their eye. They can actually bring this third eyelid up as an extra um, device, again, to spread tears, facilitate um, protection of the globe. Um, but there are diseases that happen of the third eyelid, most notably squamous cell carcinoma is one we'll talk about here briefly, where sometimes people don't realize there could be a problem and it's brewing down in that location where the third eyelid is tucked away. And it's not until the cancer hits a critical mass that suddenly it's popped up and people think, oops, it just happened. It came on so fast when in actuality, it was just growing in, in the little cavity as to where the third eyelid normally lives. And it's not until it hit critical mass that it came up. So I always encourage veterinarians to consciously depress the eyeball when they're doing clinical exams so that that third eyelid can passively come up and they can see that the third eyelid has a normal degree of excursion and that there's no masses or imperfections on the surface. And owners can do that as well. You can just put your fingers over top of the horse's eyelid, have it kind of partially closed um, down. And then if you push back on the eyelid, eyeball itself, again, through the eyelid, don't touch the eyeball, that third eyelid will, will come across and you can see that little fold. And then the last interesting thing about horse eyes is their iris. So the iris is the colored part of the eye with the pupil being the central aperture that allows for light to go through to get to our retina. So horses have <clears throat> usually brown eyes, but sometimes blue eyes, and then even more fun, sometimes a combination of blue and brown eyes. And I know there's a whole host of lay terms people use to describe um, those more unique colors in, in horses when they have the, the blue eye combinations. Horses have a horizontal pupil, and this is because from a visual standpoint, what is important to them is to be able to monitor the horizon. That's where all the threats are gonna be coming at them, the bears, the mountain lions potentially humans. And so the pupil, as it constricts with light, is gonna come down into a more narrow horizontal slit. And additionally, because horses are out in bright light environments, sometimes even the constricted pupil is still too much bright light coming into the eye. So they have this extra stru structure called the corp corpora nigra over top of the pupil so that as that pupil constricts, it's kind of like an extra sun visor covering up that area. And so that is a normal tissue in a horse. If anybody's looked in their horse's eye and think, oh no, there's a tumor in there, it's a melanoma. Thankfully it's not, it's just the normal corpora nigra. Now sometimes we can get corpora nigra develop cysts and they become more balloon looking and, and that can be addressed medically, uh, or sorry, surgically if, if we need to do that, but uh, that's gonna be beyond the scope of today's talk. All right, so again, I said we'd spend the majority of our time talking about common equine eye problems. So the big four things I'm gonna touch on today is trauma, squamous cell carcinoma, corneal ulcers, and uveitis. And frankly, each one of these topics could be an hour-long talk in and of itself. So we're just gonna to touch the surface and try to convey some of the pertinent things. So trauma can be a whole host of things that could cause a problem. It can be chemicals getting splashed or sprayed onto the eye, blunt impact energies like a horse kicking another horse, penetrating injury like the stick shown in this picture up here that's penetrated through the upper eyelid poking into the orbit, thankfully had not actually contacted the eyeball itself, or lacerations. The latter being probably the more common thing that we see with horses. They just love to get themselves tangled up in barbed wire or cut themselves on nails or somehow injure themselves in ways that we, we might not even be able to figure out. 
And so when trauma is observed, obviously we want to try to figure out if possible what happened. We really want to know what all structures are involved. And so again, my concern, you know, is the eyeball safe here or is this a lost eye? Because if this eye is, is safe, then we just need to manage the other problem. In this particular situation, this was a horse that was kicked and um, the, the fingers are palpating that there's actually a fracture palpable along that bony orbital rim that's up there. So again, we want to gently feel around. This horse also had a corneal ulcer that's visible because it has had fluorescein stain applied to the eye. And so again, evaluating what all structures are impacted by the trauma. But regardless of the cause of trauma, you're always going to want to have some anti-inflammatory medication on board in order to reduce that inflammation and alleviate the discomfort because this horse is presumably painful, right? Um, and so Flinix and Meglamine or the brand name product Banamine is generally our drug of choice. Um, we tend to go with the IV formulation, but give it orally because it has good bioavailability and is a little less costly than the paste, but the paste is great. If you don't have flunix and megalamine around, phenylbutazone also works well. Um, and generally for a standard horse, I'd be given two grams of but. And then I would highly recommend any of the horse owners out here who have uh, either observed or are suspicious that their horse undergone, underwent some trauma to call a vet immediately if there's any evidence of eyeball injury or external eyelid wounds um, because in this particular scenario of this horse who tangled up with some barbed wire this eyelid has a laceration in it it's gaping open and potentially the cornea could have been impacted. And so having a veterinarian evaluate that sooner rather than later so that not only this eyelid can get sutured up as is shown in the picture over here, but also the eyeball itself can get evaluated and medications can be used to help prevent against infection of the ocular tissues. And usually we also put them on systemic antibiotics um, to help with the, the eyelid tissues themselves. When veterinarians are doing eyelid repair, they really try not to remove any of the tissue because eyelids have great vascular supply. And so typically, if we can just really clean it up a mild degree, we can maintain a lot of that tissue and not have to go back and try to repair things with a more creative approach. We just honestly want to try to put back together where it came apart. Now, sometimes this can be a little bit of a puzzle. And again, my goal is to try to put the eyelid margin back, as is shown over here. Hopefully everybody's been seeing my mouse, by the way. Um, put that eyelid margin back together where it got torn. And so here's a horse that had gotten tangled with barbed wire. This was like a, a yearling, as I recall. And the barbed wire had created some lacerations at the outer corner of the eye. This is the lateral aspect. Here's the third eyelid medially over here. And um, stitches were put in place by the owner, who was a veterinarian, but he didn't realize actually this was the end of the eyelid that was supposed to have been stitched up over to here because again it was kind of a bloody swollen mess at the time and so this horse even though the skin seemed to heal had much too large of an eyelid opening because that eyelid margin wasn't drawn down where it was supposed to be and so this horse developed exposure keratitis, which is inflammation of the cornea because the eyelids can't blink completely and distribute tear nor tears normally. And so it started to develop this kind of leathery pigmentation, lots of blood vessel ingrowth, just hazy fibrotic change to the cornea and brought, um, brought us to see, brought the horse, excuse me, to see us about a month later. And uh, it was pretty rewarding when all we did was went back in and, and revised this area, removed the scar tissue and stitched this back together and then started the horse on a medication called cyclosporin which helps to reduce scar tissue and pigmentation. And frankly, maybe even without the medication, the horse would have done great. But that cornea cleared up beautifully once that eyelid margin was back in place where it was supposed to be. So again, we, we really always um, want to have that accurate repair. Now, sometimes there might not be any external eyelid injury, but you, again, always want to assess the cornea itself if there has been a history of potential trauma. And so I'll get to corneal ulcers here in a little bit, but um, squirting fluorescein stain onto the eye reveals to us if there's been any break in our outer epithelium layer. But here is a picture of the outer epithelium layer of the cornea actually just peeling away after a horse um, had been prepped for, a, a, I think it was a sinus surgery, and they were using their normal prep materials with chlorhexidine solution and alcohol, and accidentally something had splashed onto the eye. And sure enough, the epithelium was just 
streaming off, unfortunately. And so with any trauma, again, it's important to assess the health of the eyeball itself, even if there's not um, obvious lid injury to suggest that, that there was a problem. All right, so now we'll shift gears to squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma is the most common eyelid, or, or sorry, periocular tumor and ocular tumor in horses. And squamous cell carcinoma has pretty classic appearance. Most of the time, it appears as a pink, proliferative, kind of fleshy tissue. And so here's a picture of squamous cell carcinoma on this upper left image as a, a bulbous um, kind of change coming out and there's even some more change back behind this on the conjunctiva. Here on the lower right picture is a large squamous cell carcinoma on the front of the third eyelid. And this is a scenario where, again, when the tumor started growing and was small, it was actually hidden down where the third eyelid resides in its normal um, uh, kind of resting place. And then once this tumor continued to grow, grow, grow and hit a critical mass, then it popped up. The owners thought that it happened abruptly when indeed it just finally couldn't fit in the normal holding space for the third eyelid anymore. So again, if owners and veterinarians consciously push that eyeball back through the upper eyelid, that third eyelid will come across and you can check the, the surface of it. Here are some more images of squamous cell carcinoma. This upper left image shows an extensive lesion on the inner corner of the eyelids themselves. And this is um, an area that, that definitely worries me when I see squamous cell carcinoma in this area because it makes me concerned that it could be actually tracking down the nasal lacrimal duct and our attempts to surgically remove the visible mass and provide any adjunctive therapy in this area might not actually be reaching where the tumor might have already trekked along. So again, our preference is always to have these cases present to veterinarians sooner rather than later when the lesions are small and they're hopefully not spreading because this is an aggressive tumor that can be locally invasive, especially when it's affecting the eyelids. On the flip side, when we see corneal or, or conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma on the surface of the eyeball, those tend to be a little bit easier for us to manage because there's not as much blood supply to the surface tissues of the eye. And so even though this looks really dramatic, I can usually very successfully just come in and with a blade cut around the leading edge of that tumor, undermine it because typically the underlying cornea is still healthy and kind of peel it away like you would, you know, a big chunk of onion skin leaving the normal onion skin next layer underneath. Um, and so these don't tend to be as invasive. They don't tend to metastasize. I still would much rather have these cases present to us sooner rather than later because you can imagine the amount of scarring having to do that extensive surgery could cause from a visual standpoint. But at least clinically, these horses tend to do very, very well. And these are eyes that as long as they're visual, we want to save them. We want to simply remove the tumor, do some adjunctive treatment, but I would not recommend recommend removing this eye if this is a visual eye. And then here are just a couple more eyelid squamous cell carcinomas. This is a, a little lesion here again at the medial canthus area on the eyelid skin. I would hope that this one would be easier for us to manage and not be already trekking down the nasal lacrimal duct. But again, the sooner we can see these guys, the better. And then this final picture is probably the trickier version of squamous cell carcinoma. So I think it's always worthwhile to mention that squamous cell carcinoma has a higher predilection in horses that have a lack of pigment around their eye. And especially, it can start as these little lesions that almost look like sunburn. And frankly, it's probably a precursor lesion when they get that. But then it can start to have this erosive nature to it. And this is indeed a cancerous process that some people might unfortunately not realize because they're looking for the more obvious, fleshy, pink, you know, concerning change. And so we always recommend for horses who don't have pigment around their face that owners monitor for any change to the eyelid margin. So here the eyelid margin is nice and smooth and looking normal over here. And then, oh crap, this is where we start to see some irregularity. Here's where we start to see a lot of irregularity. And again, this would warrant evaluation by a veterinarian as soon as possible so that we could try to do something to um, at least bare minimum take a biopsy and, and confirm if our suspicion is right that this is a cancerous process and then make a definitive plan to address that. So our goal for squamous cell carcinoma is to destroy the tumor while preserving as much ocular function and cosmesis as possible. So again, if it's a visual eye, 
I'm going to try to do everything in my power to maintain that eye if I can still safely remove the tumor and do some adjunctive treatment. Sometimes when cases pre present at too advanced of a state, there's nothing that we can do aside from remove the eye in order to try to prevent the cancer from spreading elsewhere in the tissues or even metastasizing to other parts of the body. But again, our goal, whenever possible, try to save the eye, try to preserve that, that functionality. And then the adjunctive therapies that people could utilize for squamous cell carcinoma are highly variable. We've got things like cryotherapy, chemotherapy, um, immunotherapy, radiation. There's a whole host of things. And depending upon what doctors have at their disposal to use or referral inst institutions have available are going to dictate what preferences there are. Um, and sometimes it becomes a money situation where, yeah, maybe the ideal is to do photo dynamic therapy on an eyelid and, and you know, the cost is going to be $5,000, maybe we can do something that is less expensive and use chemotherapy agents in addition to, to surgery. Um, but each individual patient and each individual situation is, is going to be different. But we always recommend some adjunctive therapy. Doing surgical removal alone typically is not sufficient because these tumors tend to have again, the capacity to have spread locally. So we always wanna make sure we're treating the tissue bed or the, the surrounding um, tissues with something as an adjunct. And then recheck is imperative for these guys. We want them to be reevaluated at least every six months on the ongoing um, process. And so usually with fall and spring vaccines is a great time to consciously have somebody look at the eyelids, check the third eyelid, look at the eye, whatever it might be to make sure there's no new lesions popping up because again, it's so much better to catch them when they're small. And for horses who've had a history of squamous cell carcinoma, or for those light-colored horses that we're trying to reduce the predisposing risk factor of UV light, um, we do have a variety of masks that can block out 95% or more of the UV rays. The pictures shown here are two examples. The equine sun visor seems to be um, preferred by a lot of owners. It, it fits really well with the horses and horses um, do, uh, they seem to like it. The Guardian mask has these kind of bug out step offs that um, some people feel that if, if the other mask is going to be too close to the eye, rubbing on the eyelashes, their horses might not like it. And so this Guardian mask is another option. And even if somebody doesn't want to invest in this, you know, $100 plus mask, a normal fly mask still at least controls like 60 to 70% of the UV rays. And so that would be at least a bare minimum recommendation for those patients. But again, we really like these other masks. And then over the years, people have investigated whether eyelid tattooing is advantageous to prevent against the, oh, I have a question popping up, um, whether it's helpful to prevent against squamous cell carcinoma. And unfortunately, there's just not enough cases and controlled studies that have evaluated that. So we really don't know whether eyelid tattooing makes a difference. It does make the horses look pretty to have the eyeliner there. Um, but I know with humans who have tattoos, they still say they can get sunburn over that tattoo. And so it's likely that because the pigment is deposited so deep in the tissues, it's actually probably not going to be completely protected. All right, there's a question that came up. Are there any specific breeds of equine that this can become more high risk, like heavy, heavy breeds like draft or thoroughbred? And yes, we definitely have breed predilections. Draft horses indeed are a high, dis, high predisposed breed. Halflingers, even though they're a smaller version of a draft, definitely have this as a problem and a genetic problem in a lot of these guys like Halflingers, Belgians, um, Appaloosas. POAs, paints, but we can see it even in the thoroughbreds, the Arabians, the quarter horses, being not one of those predisposed breeds doesn't protect you. So it's still advantageous to watch for these changes. And thank you very much for, for posting that question. All right, so now we'll shift gears into corneal ulceration. This is a very common problem in horses because frankly, they live in an environment where things are possibly poking in them at all points in time. This is one of my, my horses that I had when I was younger and she's eating right next to that hay bunk and poking the, the hays are poking out there. And so you can imagine if she's casually eating then all of a sudden something startles her, she could toss her head and these exposed eyes are easy to get traumatized. And so it's important to watch for signs of corneal ulceration that are actually very general eye sign, sorry, eye pain signs, such as squinting, 
tearing. You might also see swelling to the eyelids or color change like redness to the wide of the eye, redness to the third eyelid, or even cloudiness to the eyeball itself. Um, with corneal ulcers, frankly, if we catch these fast and we get them started on treatment, they tend to do really, really well, but they do need to be closely monitored because there are a whole host of complicating factors that can happen in horses, such as infectious processes like bacteria and fungal organisms, as well as even sometimes horses will get a melting process without the presence of, of a bacteria or a fungus. More commonly, it's with infection. So we'll have some pictures of these things. Um, we'll start off with the pictures of simple ulcers. So these are horses that have had just an abrasion to the surface of, of the cornea, removing that epithelium, but it hasn't actually chunked out any portion of the deeper tissue. And then both of these eyes have had fluorescein stain applied. So fluorescein is the green um, dye that's, that's showing the actual area of the ulcer, but these eyes Otherwise, don't have signs of infection present in terms of there's no infiltrate, there's no crazy blood vessel ingrowth, and even the, the small amount of discharge here is just a little bit of mucoid or serous discharge. And so simple ulcers are best managed with a topical broad spectrum antibiotic, something like Neopolybac is great, although it's important to make sure you look at the, the tube and make sure there's no steroid in it. So no dexamethasone, no hydrocortisone. Atropine is also incredibly helpful. Atropine always has a red cap, so that's why I threw a picture up here. Um, atropine helps to alleviate pain because it paralyzes the muscles that are spasming inside of the eye and it keeps the pupil dilated. And sometimes with a simple ulcer, even just a single dose of atropine will do. But for horses that are more uncomfortable, they can get the atropine once a day or twice a day. Um, but there is the idiosyncratic colic potential, which is something that you just want to monitor for horses, making sure they're not going off feed or having reduced feces or anything like that. And then we also want to give them a systemic pain medication like flumixin or phenylbutazone. Again, if it's a minor injury, maybe just a couple days of that will suffice. The eye should be rechecked in three to five days because frankly, even large ulcers can heal when they're just a simple one, not infected, within a matter of days. And so they should be either completely healed or making progress toward healing in that period of time. But if they're not healing, if they're completely the same or if they're even larger or deeper, then that's concerning. That's indications of complication. And so complicated corneal ulcers, again, could be infected, they could have the melting component, and these guys need much more aggressive therapy than the protocol that I just mentioned. Usually we're doing multiple types of antibiotics, so my favorite for a potentially infected horse ulcer is um, like ofloxacin and chloramphenicol going at least every two hours. I also tend to use serum or plasma as an anti-melting agent at the same frequency every one to two hours. Um, we also will continue to use that atropine, you know, two, three, sometimes even four times a day if we need to get that pupil to open up and it's not responding. And then oral medications like that full dose banamine twice a day, sometimes oral antibiotics. If we think we have a fungal infection based on here in Iowa, we experience fungus and depending on different parts of the country and world, you might also, we might also cover our bases with topical voriconazole and maybe even some systemic antifungal medication. Um, I like to hospitalize these patients so that I can see how they're responding to that saturation of medications. I don't expect the cornea to heal in a matter of two days, but I do expect the pupil to be responding by opening up to the atropine. I do expect the horse's comfort to be improving, and that tells me we're at least on the right track, and hopefully the cornea is not looking any worse. Now, horses who attempt to rub at their eye, they do need to wear one of these eye saver masks, like is shown here, to prevent against damage that could cause rupture of the eye. And then for horses who have very deep ulcers or ulcers that are not responding appropriately to treatment, we do have a whole host of corneal surgery options and various graft procedures like conjunctival graft, collagen graft, equine amnion, or for horses that can't undergo surgery, even corneal cross-linking is a procedure that we can use to try to um, give it as a uh, stabilize the melting process, somewhat of a disinfectant procedure. So here are just some pictures I'm gonna show of bad ulcers. This is a very deep ulcer that's all the way down to the lowest limit of the cornea on the verge of rupture. He definitely needed surgery. This is another deep ulcer. You can kind of appreciate we've got a ledge there that tells us that we've lost some of that meaty tissue of the cornea. And this eye also has tons of infiltrate in it. These blood vessels are growing in. This is definitely an infected ulcer. 
Here are two examples of melting ulcers. We've got this um, young, uh, I think it was like a six month old foal or, or something, weanling that had a complete melt of the cornea. And this doesn't look slimy, but it was. It was kind of like a, a jello jiggler where it kind of just, just moved and that's not normal. Cornea should be firm. It should not act like that. This is the more dramatic degree of a melting ulcer where it looks like this is maybe mucoid discharge coming off the eye and unfortunately it's not. That is the cornea that's melting like candle wax because of the enzymes with the infectious agents or in the tear film. Here are some more infected ulcers because um, we can see the infiltrate in the cornea, this kind of whitish yellowish change should never be in the cornea. Both of these eyes have that change to the cornea. And so this is like almost an abscess. Sometimes you will have it as an open ulcer. Sometimes it'll be tricky and the epithelium will not have a break in it and it'll be an intrastromal corneal abscess. And those still need very aggressive treatment with medications that can penetrate through that intact cornea. Um, um, but uh, I'm not going to have time to get into that. I know that we got to keep rolling. Um, here's some more ulcers. Again, infiltrate. This was a nasty bacterial ulcer. This ulcer doesn't look that bad, but this was actually fungal plaques. And the cytology sample that we took showed that. Um, I'm a huge fan when I see these horses is um, if they're coming to me and the owner doesn't want to go for surgery, I will actually still try to kind of cut away a portion of these infected plaques in a very safe manner. It's kind of scary to take a blade that close to the eye, but I do kind of try to shave that off in order to minimize the load of infectious organism and the work that the eye is gonna to have to do. So there was a question here, are there any effective alternatives to voriconazole as it can be very costly? Um, voriconazole used to be very costly, at least the bottles that we have in our pharmacy now are much cheaper. I wanna say the bottle that makes up 20 milliliters is maybe only like 60 or $70 and that goes a long way. But there were times when that bottle of medication was like $300. And so indeed, some of the other options we can use for our presumed fungal ulcers would be silver sulfadiazine dermatologic cream. We know that that's well tolerated when you put it in the eye. And if you kind of put a glob of it in and try to blink it around and it just falls out, you can dilute it down. I think it's like a one to nine ratio with sterile water or saline in order to get it more liquefied if you want to push it through a lavage line. Um, you can also even do over the counter like monostat. Anything is better than nothing if you think you're dealing with a fungal ulcer and your client has financial limitations. Thanks for that question. Oh, and then here are some bad ulcers that are to the point that they're making me worried they're about to rupture. So these um, ulcers have this dark central area here, visible within the area of the whole cornea that doesn't look so good. And this dark area tells me that we're getting close to the interior of the eye. And so what can happen, oh look, I already went there, perfect, is then we can have a ruptured ulcer. And with a ruptured ulcer, you might see this clotted material of fibrin, plugging the hole. You might even see the dark tissue of the iris having come forward to plug or protrude from the hole. And when an eye ruptures, that doesn't mean it's a lost cause, but it's definitely less ideal than us taking them to surgery before they rupture. And so by all means, if we have horses where the eyes are starting to look bad, we'd rather have you send them to somebody who can try to fix that. Or if you're owner's not willing to refer, but you're a veterinarian willing to try some microsurgery, as long as you've got good magnification, good instrumentation, basic technique ideas of, of what to do, you know, if your next step is removal of the eye, by all means, then maybe trying to fix this with the conjunctival graft is, is worthwhile. I'm not a fan of putting in temporary tarsorophies or third eyelid flaps for ulcers because it really does hide what's going on. And I want to have the owners and, and everybody be able to monitor these eyes so that even if they've declined referral on the first um, offer, they might change their mind and, and can know if it is going bad. So because horses don't really um, like to have medications applied to their eye every one to two hours and trying to open that eyelid can be problematic and actually compromise the integrity of the eye if the horse squints down against your force of trying to open the eyelids, we recommend placing a subpalpebral lavage line. And we just placed one of those this morning in, in a horse who, who did have an ulcer and needs this aggressive treatment. And that is a tube that is actually um, inserted through the eyelids. So the, act, the end point 
empties underneath the eyelid and then the tube is rolled back through the forelock and main and then the injection port is way back here. So it's easy for owners and veterinarians and technicians to be able to give liquid medications into that little injection port. We then follow it with air and that advances the medication onto the eye. And um, the lavage lines are inert. They can definitely stay in place for months. I think the record is I had a horse who had one in for 11 months. Um, so by all means, this is a great resource. Um, and it can go in the upper lid, as is shown in this left-hand picture, or in the lower lid, as is shown in the right-hand picture. And I'm a big fan of actually using the needle that um, we use to advance the line through the eyelid to also take bites of the skin so that I don't have to have these tape tabs that horses seem to rub out. I know different people have different feelings on these. Um, and, and if you're concerned, it might have a higher risk of a, an abscess formation. By all means, if they're not already going to be on an oral antibiotic, you can put them on maybe five days of, of TMS if you opt to do that. But I would say foals are the worst at ripping out their, their little tacking sutures. So I really like doing that method. Alrighty, and then our last big topic we'll talk about is uveitis. This is inflammation inside of the eye. And unfortunately, it's the most common cause of blindness in horses. Even though ulcers are the more common problem, it doesn't usually lead to blindness. But this one, unfortunately, can. And acute uveitis can happen in any horse, and there's a whole host of causes. But probably the one we worry most about is equine recurrent uveitis. Some people know it as moon blindness, because this is a recurring form of inflammation that sometimes never quiets down, or as it recurs, it causes progressive damage to the eye. And so any inflammation in the eye is going to have, again, some of these same symptoms like we talked about with ulcers, redness, squinting, tearing, cloudiness. We also tend to get some light sensitivity um, where the horses maybe when they go out in the bright light squint more. So that is something you can keep tabs on. And then when we look into the eye, we might notice the pupils very constricted. And if horses have a light colored iris naturally with inflammation in, in affecting that tissue, the light colored iris might start to turn more murky color, yellow, or even have a red hue to it. Unfortunately, with brown irises, that's not as easy to catch that symptom. The concerns about uveitis that is left unchecked is we can have scarring adhesions form in the eye where the pupil adheses down to the lens or even adheses to itself. We can have cataracts form. We can develop glaucoma because of scarring of the drainage angle inside of the eye. We can detach the retina. And so all those things can be blinding problems and it's definitely preferred for us to catch and manage uveitis sooner rather than later. So here's just some general signs of eye pain that you might see horses manifesting with. Squinting in this horse with these eyelashes deviated totally down. Tearing in this horse, tearing in this horse. Again, eyelashes down, kind of some cloudiness appreciable there. This horse also had the eyelashes deviated down, cloudiness to the eye, actually swollen eyelids, and then again, some discharge, although it was green because we applied fluorescein stain. And then as we look closely at the eye, sometimes the cloudiness that we see is due to fibrin accumulation inside of the eye. This is a big clot of, of protein because of the inflammatory process. Um, we have in this eye evidence of blood vessels growing in. We've got a blue iris that's turned yellow, a very constricted pupil. I think this pupil was dilated with atropine. That's why it's not constricted. And then even this eye, we have some blood in the bottom of the eye. You can see blood or pus, depending upon what's going on. This is a horse who was not showing any signs of pain because it had the form of uveitis that's the insidious cause or the insidious kind that doesn't show outward pain and it's just this smoldering bonfire happening inside of the eye. And the owner astutely noticed that the horse normally had blue eyes and they turned to this more kind of greenish, you know, cream color. Um, and then on close examination, we could see that indeed there was lots of redness to the wide of the eye, constricted pupil, and there were even some blood vessels visible on the surface of the iris. And so thankfully this owner did notice the color change, got him to us, and with treatment, we were able to get his eye back to blue within a few weeks. Now this horse, again, dark colored iris, it, it's so much harder to appreciate the change, but this iris is actually abnormally pigmented. It's very muddy, dark color. Normal brown irises should have multiple tones to them. And so if we start to see this homogenous, really dark color, that makes me think we've had previous inflammation and possibly ongoing inflammation. And then this pupil has adhesed down to the lens. And so it's misshapen. It's no longer that nice horizontal ellipse. It's all moth-eaten down here because it's stuck. 
and then looking into the eye, this yellowish green cast is highly abnormal. Some people call that like swamp water look. And that's because there's severe inflammation in the back of the eye inside the vitreal cavity. And, um, and this horse did require a cyclosporin implant in order to control that. And then unfortunately, sometimes we get presented horses where owners wanna to try to have us fix the eye, but they've already had so many changes that we can't do anything to restore vision. And so these are both examples of horses who have very advanced cataracts. Um, this particular horse, again, tried to stick its iris down, or sorry, its pupil down to the lens and almost to itself. Um, and I think at least in this eye, the owner had wanted cataract surgery and we gave them a very poor prognosis, but we did proceed with evaluating the retina status and it was detached based on ultrasound, and so it was not a candidate for surgery. So keys to success for managing uveitis is diagnosing it early, and, and because the symptoms of pain can be with uveitis or ulcers, we always recommend staying the eye and look at the cornea. Make sure there, there's no corneal pathology to explain the symptoms. And then assuming it is just the primary uveitis, we want to treat them really aggressively with topical anti-inflammatories like topical steroids. My favorite is predacetate, though the dexamethasone and neopolydex is also good. You want to avoid hydrocortisone, avoid betamethasone. They just can't penetrate through intact cornea, so they're not going to do any good for the horse. We also want to treat with atropine as long as the horse doesn't have any secondary glaucoma. We also want to treat with either oroflunixin or bute at that full dose level to try to quiet the inflammation. Sometimes in really challenging cases, I even use oral steroids. Um, and then some of the adjunct treatments that we could consider, we do a fair number of intravitreal low-dose genomycin injections here that helps to quiet the inflammation in some of these eyes and is a more cost-effective option than the suprachoroidal cyclosporin implant, which is being shown here. This is a surgically placed implant versus the injection with genomycin is just a sedated procedure. Um, and the implants have pretty darn good success rate, but unfortunately nothing we do is a guarantee with uveitis. And so we always tell the owners that we, we are kind of giving them a guarded prognosis because especially with equine recurrent uveitis, it can come back up and we can have again these, these scarring changes that can be visually impairing. One of the things that I tend to stress to my owners is even if the eye starts looking better, we're not gonna let up on treatment. We're gonna gradually taper down the medications because if you think of uveitis like a bonfire in the eye and you throw a bucket of water on the bonfire, oh, you think you put the bonfire out, but no, there's probably some hot embers down there and given enough time, they're probably gonna flare back up. So I wanna throw the bucket on and then I wanna keep splashing Dixie cups of water on that eye by doing my gradual taper of my topical anti-inflammatories, gradually taper my other medications, making sure that I've treated for at least two weeks, if not even a month, past the resolution of clinical signs to make sure we put out that fire. So there's a question that popped up for the insidious form of uveitis. Are there other signs or clues you can see besides color change? Uh, I wish there was. Unfortunately, probably the pupil size is the best thing for owners to monitor because the constricted pupil is a classic sign of uveitis unless they already have scars that have formed and restricted the, the uh, ability of that pupil to open and close. So pupil size is what I tend to have owners monitor for with the um, potential risk insidious uveitis horses. And I know I go down and I feed my horses twice a day and especially in the winter time, it's dark. So it's easy enough just to take a light and flash it on the eye. And in a dark light environment, a normal horse's pupil should be easily 75% open. So if that pupil is small, even in that dark light setting, that's an indicator that maybe they are having insidious uveitis flare up. But otherwise, they don't have the squinting, they don't have the blepharospasm. If owners can open up the eyelids, they can maybe assess the white of the eye and watch that. But again, they're going to have to consciously watch for these things. From a clinical exam standpoint, I love looking for aqueous flare. I love teaching our students students and, and at CE Talks how to look for aqueous flare using the direct ophthalmoscope on the tiny circle beam holding it really close to the eye from the front and me look from the side and if I see that beam of light course through the anterior chamber that's supportive of aqueous flare and indicative of uveitis. So I apologize. I know we're going a little long. Let me get to these last couple slides I wanted to talk to. Um, when to call a vet. So for the horse owners out in the world, if you see just minor tearing or little eye goobers that are minor, don't worry about it. My horse gets that, you know, periodically, probably just something blue in the eye and um, little mucus goober there is no big deal. 
Same thing with minor redness or swelling. You know, maybe there was an insect bite. Maybe they brushed their head on something. But if it's not, um, you know, overly problematic, I do just watch that. And if it goes away in a day or two, then I'm good with it. If it doesn't go away in a day or two, then that would be warranted to call a veterinarian and make sure that somebody's going to be able to come out and look at this eye to see what's going on. Maybe there is a persisting situation where something blew into the eye and got caught in the tear film and is still lodged there like a little foreign body. Or any horses who have minor squinting um, that is, you know, again, directing those eyelids down, um, especially along with cloudiness to the eye. Again, if it's minor, it doesn't need to be an emergency, but I would definitely call a vet. And then if you see a mass on the eye that you think could be cancer, again, not an emergency, but sure, call a vet, get an appointment set up as, as soon as is reasonable. If you see moderate squinting or holding the eye completely closed, that warrants calling a vet right away, in my personal opinion, because there's a whole host of bad things that could be going on. If we see moderate to severe tearing or other ocular discharge along with squinting. So again, some horses might just have normal discharge, but keep the eye open, maybe not a big deal. But if we start combining these things, then that's a cause for concern. And this horse up here, unfortunately, was a sad case of a deep stromal abscess where the clinical sign was indeed tearing, holding the eye, midway closed, and they unfortunately watched that for three weeks. And by the time they got to us, this eye was um, a very advanced corneal stromal abscess. And um, unfortunately, the, the eye had already irreversibly lost vision. Lots of times we can save these if they come to us you know, within the first week or so. But unfortunately, this one had already burned out the eye. And so we definitely want people to call it that straight away if they notice those signs. And then again, lots of redness to the eye, lots of swelling, you should call straight away. Any eyeball cloudiness, frankly, along with signs of pain, warrants getting um, a vet lined up right away. And then also rapid vision loss. If the horse was normal, seeing things fine yesterday, and BAM is, is you know, not confident bumping into things today, something's changed and we need to take a look at that. And then again, when to see a specialist. So whether this be a veterinary ophthalmologist or an equine surgeon, just somebody with a higher level of, of um, maybe experience and training, complex eyelid wounds. Again, we don't wanna have to remove a bunch of tissue. We'd rather try to piece it together or shift things. Um, large periocular tumors that require more advanced adjunctive treatments. Um, ulcers that are again, either not responding to appropriate therapy that are definitely infected and, and melting and you know, kind of your, outside of your comfort level. Um, any of those ulcers that start at over 50% depth, I think warrant option to see a specialist because I will offer surgery on those. Not everybody elects to go forward with surgery and there's definitely cases we can get to heal with medications alone, but I think it's op or sorry, ideal to offer that referral. Um, eyes that are already ruptured, again, I would love to see those eyes, see if we can save them. Unfortunately, sometimes we can't, but we sure try. Um, corneal stromal abscess, I didn't spend a lot of time on it, but I alluded to it, that it's an infection within the cornea not an ulcer, um, non-responsive or recurrent uveitis, cataracts, like this horse here had a cataract and was interested in cataract surgery. And that one was a good candidate because the retina was healthy. Um, glaucoma, this is an example of a glaucoma to sigh. Um, again, blindness, really anytime that you're concerned, it's, it's an option to consider. Alrighty, and then I had some thoughts about eye examination, but because I've gone over my, my 45 minutes, I think what we'll do is um, open it up to questions from the group. See if anybody had any additional questions. All right, I don't hear anybody unmuting and I don't see an additional question. So for anybody who needs to leave, I understand, but I can just go through these last slides for anybody who's still listening. So, um, if you are taking your horse to see a, a veterinarian or your veterinarian's coming out to see your horse or you're seeing a specialist, some of the things to expect out of the eye examination is that the um, horse should be examined in a dark environment. This is um, my horse out on a bright sunny day. All I can say is that she has an eye. I frankly can't see anything into that eye because her brown iris has that pupil so constricted, so that's not going to be super helpful. Versus this is my other horse when she was in a stall in a barn, that pupil is widely dilated and you're getting that nice flashback from the back of the eye. That's very easy to accomplish an eye exam. And if you're going out to do a field call and you don't have the ability to put them into a barn 
and where the lights can be turned down, you can literally just throw a blanket over your head and the horse's head. You might want to sedate the horse first if it's going to freak out. And you can create a localized dark environment. Or you can schedule your horse call at 5 p.m. on a winter day and it's going to be dark. If it's, if it's an eye call, that'll give you a better ability to do the eye exam. And then from an equipment standpoint, bare minimum, we need a bright focal light source. Um, it's optimal to have a few different instruments to do eye examination with, like a transilluminator and a direct ophthalmoscope, and magnification is key. Um, if you come see a specialist, we have a whole host of other fun things that we can use. Um, vision assessment in horses, I always advocate covering one eye and doing this menacing gesture to make sure that they can blink and see each eye. I sometimes see people doing a menace response without covering the eye, and the horses, again, have phenomenal peripheral vision. So even a horse that's blind in one eye is going to blink if you're in that peripheral vision. If a horse squints too much when you cover one eye and they don't want to open the other eye, then I just create a little blinder so I can do the vision assessment in that way and they're at least not having the peripheral vision capacity. Um, sedation and nerve blocks, again, are, are going to be commonly utilized for horses when they have eye exams, especially if they're really painful because we don't want to compromise the eye trying to open the lids and look at it. And then some of the tests that, that might be done, fluorescein stain is the one that I've alluded to a few times. And frankly, I think it should be performed on every single horse who's um, presenting to a veterinarian with a complaint of an eye concern. And you can either apply it directly to the eye with a little strip or squirt it on the eye as is shown here. And again, like we talked about before, positive uptake of that fluorescein stain indicates that we do have a break in the, in the outer surface of the corneal epithelium and is indicative of an ulcer. Sometimes we have the ability to check intraocular pressure in horses. Not all veterinarians have this device, but this Tonavet type device looks like a funny gun. It is ideal for checking horse intraocular pressure because it actually has an equine calibration setting for their big curving cornea. And normal horse pressure is between 15 and 30. 30. Horses with uvi just tend to have a lower pressure. Horses with glaucoma have a higher pressure, and that's the picture that's shown here. This diffusely cloudy eye, big dilated pupil, and the pressure I think was like up around 50, unfortunately. So my final thoughts were that eyes are awesome, they're super important for the horses, and they're quite vulnerable. And so because some problems can get bad really fast, it's always better to be safe than sorry. And, and again, have a veterinarian evaluate your horse if you're concerned about an eye issue. Um, and, and by all means, you can even get a second opinion sometimes if somebody you know, doesn't think, oh, that's not a big deal, um, but you're still concerned about something, you can go ahead and call a specialist or just call somebody else to get a different thought on something. And since we have so many veterinary students and veterinarians um, on this, I did have a little promo here for this textbook, Equine Ophthalmology by Brian Gilger. It is a phenomenal resource that goes through all the various things that we tend to see with horse eyes. And so if you are seeing horses a lot, um, then getting this, this textbook, or if you're a vet student, you can probably download from the library the chapters of it. Um, you can have this as a resource. That's great. And then I guess what I'll do is I'll end on this last slide that was supposed to be a bonus slide, but only because it came up um, earlier, the breed predilections. Alrighty, which are more likely for a pasture horse? Uh-oh, which are more likely for what? Will you unmute or clarify what you're asking about? Because I don't know what part of my conversation I was at. are more likely. Yeah, I'm sorry. I missed when the question first popped up. All righty. Well, um, uh, again, thank you everyone for attending the webinar today. I'll turn things back over to Tracy at this point in time, unless this question, oh, here we go. There we go. What are some states of squamous cell carcinoma? Oh, okay, I, okay, so never mind. Two questions. Which are most likely for the pasture horse in terms of eye problems? So, eye problems that I'd worry about more in a pasture horse would be eye trauma, whether it be again trauma to the eyelids, ulceration of the cornea, um, as well as squamous cell carcinoma because we're out in the light. But again, frankly, any horse, whether it be a pasture horse or a stabled horse, can have these things and uveitis. Um, and then the second question was what are some states of squamous cell carcinoma that you would have to remove the eye? So generally, if squamous cell carcinoma 
is involving the eyelids broadly, um, then we don't have always the best ability to uh, reconstruct those tissues. And so we might actually have to remove the entire eye, again, if it's too extensive on both eyelids. If it's just a portion of an area, we might try to do some grafting techniques and, and save the eye. I would say that the cases that, that come to see us on ophthalmology are ones that people think it's worth trying to save the eye. And so I have rarely had to go to eye removal, but I'm sure our equine surgery service gets a whole host of ones that are just far too advanced and whether that be extensive along the eyelids affecting also the third eyelid and affects affecting the eyeball it just might not be that we can remove enough of that tissue to still have a healthy eye but everybody that comes to see us we really strive even if it's quite extensive to do what we can of removing the affected tissue shifting tissues around and again we do have more um advanced modalities than maybe what some veterinarians have at their disposal. And so there might be scenarios where, yeah, I could maybe save an eye by doing some of these more advanced things. But if a client's not willing to come here, then, then maybe a general vet who only has cryosurgery doesn't have that ability. And it is going to be better for the horse to simply remove the eye. But one of the things I didn't mention that can be um, considered when there are small lesions of squamous cell carcinoma on the ocular surface, um, we can do topical compounded chemotherapy agents like 5-fluorouracil and mitomycin C. Those can be pretty cost effective and it's something at least worth trying um, to see if we can get that, that reduced. Ideally in conjunction with debulking of the mass, um, eyelid uh, treatments, those don't work so well for the eyelid. And so usually we're gonna be doing injections of chemotherapy agents like cisplatin or carboplatin or even the BCG compounds. Um, but again, the, the spectrum of options is incredibly wide and it's just gonna be based on the individual owner's interest.